Good morning, beloved. Pastor Jay Williams here, lead pastor of Union Church of Boston. I'm in Rhode Island right now, uh, but wherever we are, uh, be it in Texas, in Tennessee, in Boston, in Connecticut, all over the world, wherever we are, uh, sanctuary is in that place. So we are glad to be at Union. At Union, you are indeed family uh, and you are welcome in this place. Uh, today, as we gather, we are just exceedingly happy. We are exceedingly happy that today, uh, this entire weekend, in fact, is a weekend of celebration. Uh, so we will continue to celebrate Juneteenth. We will celebrate Father's Day. Uh, we've got a litany and prayer planned, uh, but we say happy Father's Day uh, to all of our fathers in the place today. Uh, we um, are just uh, joyful that even though we continue to linger in this pandemic space, uh, and worshiping online virtually that we can gather, that we can be a church together. Indeed, we are a faith community where hope lives, the love of God is experienced, uh, and the Holy Spirit is just moving in this place. And we'll move to be sure in the preaching of Pastor Nikki uh, today. We're excited about the word that God has for us in uh, Pastor Nikki. We've got a, a, a advocacy report from our Greater Boston Interfaith Organization uh, core team uh, about all of the ways in which we are striving to live out, right, the truth and the meaning of Juneteenth, of liberation and abolition of the injustices and inequities that uh, cause strife and harm uh, to the beloved of God. If it's your first time here at Union, we say it, it a special welcome to you. We are glad that you are in the house in Zoom room today. Go ahead and put in the chat if it is your first time and a member of the pastoral team can reach out to you. Uh, both our first time worshipers and all of us, you can download a bulletin if you go to unionboston.org forward slash online. And there, if it's your first time, you can fill out a connect card and then uh, let us know if you want a pastoral team member to reach out to you. We are planning a new member service uh, in a couple of weeks. We've got a number of new members uh, ready to join and take those membership files. Uh, so we're excited about all that God is doing. Indeed, that all that God will do in this room on today. Uh, so before we go into celebrations of Father's Day with our litany and also a celebration of Juneteenth. We're going to set the context, uh, refresh our memories about why this day is so significant for us. We would be absolutely remiss if we did not take an opportunity to give a special shout out to the now Reverend Kyle William Walden, who was commissioned. Uh, Kyle was commissioned as a provisional elder in the United Methodist Church was commissioned on Monday. Uh, is, is Kyle, are you spotlighted? Yes, Let's, I'm uh, here. Yeah, yeah, there we go, there we go. Uh, go ahead, uh, talk to your, your community here. Yes, uh, beloved, I was, uh, I had the privilege of going down to Dallas uh, this last week and with the North Texas Annual Conference getting commissioned by the bishop down there and by the Annual Conference so I'm officially a reverend, uh, and I'm an elder in provisional connection of the United Methodist Church, which is very exciting. Um, and this is one of the big parts of, uh, of becoming, you know, I'll be appointed now July 1st as the pastor of strategic engagement here at Union, which is just a continuation and a living into more deeply uh, my calling here at Union and in the United Methodist Church. So thank you all so much for your love and support, uh, as always. And yeah, I'm just, I, I thank God every day um, that we, that Angie and I found union and that God has called us to this place. So much love to y'all. Much love to you, uh, Reverend Kyle, and to Angie as well. Is Angie on? I'm, I, I saw her. <laughs> yeah, she's on. over here. <laughs> oh, okay, so, oh, there you go. Well, Angie, come on, scoot on over in the, in the camera view here. If, <laughs> sorry for putting you on the spot, <laughs> but you know, this is how we roll here at Union. Hey, Angie, <laughs> congratulations to you too. Um, and just excited for all that she's uh, doing as well. Um, and y'all are down in Atlanta, right? Yes, Angie's down here for uh, her summer rotation for optometry. Um, so once she finishes this rotation, she'll be back in Boston for another two rotations to finish up optometry school. So she's almost there. Uh, she's doing great. 
she wasn't prepared to be on camera, so uh, yes, yes. please. Well, they, <laughs> yeah, we're glad she popped it on great. in. We're proud of Angie. We're proud of you, uh, Reverend Kyle. And uh, in absentia, uh, we also celebrate another member of our community, Reverend Blair Stowe. Uh, she joined us as an affiliate member uh, a few months ago. We'll hear from her um, uh, soon. Uh, but she was ordained an elder in the California Pacific Conference on yesterday. She's a doctoral student at BU, uh, so she's a part of our community, but she's also now an ordained elder. So we celebrate uh, Blair. Uh, this time of the year is a time of conferencing in the United Methodist Church, a time of uh, testing the spirit and, and pouring out spirit in ordination uh, and in these celebrations. And we are excited that the spirit is still being poured out upon us, we who are gathered here. Uh, so we turn then uh, to a time of giving thanks, of honoring, of celebrating and remembering uh, the fathers and the lost, uh, perhaps uh, the pain of never knowing a father. We hold these tensions in our time today uh, as we give thanks, as we remember. So turn it to you, Reverend Kyle and Minister Michaela. Thank you, Pastor Jane. Um, as we go into the litany this morning, um, beloved, I, I invite you in this time and throughout the service to lift up the names of any beloved fathers or father figures uh, that you want honored in this in this space. Um, I think about you know my own dad, and as I was uh, going into commissioning, I was thinking about my. Uh, late great uncle um, who I knew was with me in spirit as I went up to be commissioned on Monday. So please take this time in this moment uh, to lift up names in the chat or in your hearts for those fathers that go with us this day and that we celebrate. And when the litany ends, if there's anything uh, that this liturgy may have left out but you felt stirring in your heart, I also invite you to lift that up because liturgy means the work of the people and this is something that we do together. So let us enter into this liturgy together. I will be the leader and Minister Michaela will be the people part. Fathers come in many different forms and today we celebrate them all. We thank you for fathers and father figures, biological and chosen, for dads, grandfathers, uncles, theos, cousins, brothers, mentors, teachers, and friends. We are beloved children of these and of you, God. Thank God for fathers. Thank God for my father. For those men who have now joined God in heaven and whom we miss dearly here on earth. Thank God for the fathers of the past. For those men who have lost a child to death and must now carry on. Thank God for the fathers who are so strong. For the men who took in others' children through adoption and foster care. And for the men who may have wanted children of their own but choose to father everyone else. Thank God for the fathers with hearts so big. Thank God for the fathers in spirit. For every man who is working day and night to raise and provide for his children today, and for every man who is preparing for the gift of fatherhood. Thank God for the fathers of today. Thank God for soon to be fathers. We thank, we thank you, Lord, Lord, for the men, for the men and, fatherly and fatherly figures, figures who have influenced, who have influenced our, lives our lives in so many ways. So many ways. We pray that we will we honor, them honor them in everything, everything we do. We do. And on this Father's Day, we remember those who have complicated relationships with their fathers. That makes this day not one of celebration, but of pain. For those whose fathers were absent, struggled with addiction, or were abusive. Holy God, we pray for your grace to hold them on this day. In the mixture of joy and sorrow of this day for our community, we thank you, God, for your steadfast parental love. Amen. Amen.
Juneteenth is a deeply emotional moment for enslaved people because for decades, for, for centuries, enslaved people prayed for, hoped for, fought for in the form of slave rebellions, running away, bought their freedom when they could. And if you read slave narratives, if you listen to spirituals from the era of slavery, you know that enslaved people longed for freedom. This was something that had been hoped for, but many believe may never come. Being able to go wherever they wanted, being able to wonder about. For enslaved people, it was an expression of their freedom. Well, Matt Porter was the one that, that long Miss Porter one of our white folks in there. So she come along, we all sitting on the fence, and the colored children come along and asked her, did she want to go with them? And she said, yes, she might as one of them horses. She went on with them. I never did see her and hit that no more. When I think about Juneteenth, I think about it in the context of Emancipation Day celebrations that began January 1, 1863. They took on a whole new meaning when slavery was formally abolished after 1865. You would have had African-American veterans who fought in the Civil War be prominent in these celebrations, dressed in their military garb, speeches from enslaved people, the most prominent Black politicians singing of hymns, spirituals, discussions of, of registering to vote. Enslaved people celebrating in public their newfound freedom was an act of resistance. Because we have to remember slavery came to an end after a four years bloody, bloody civil war. Still the, the bloodiest conflict in American history. Many people in the South and in the nation who did not want to see slavery abolished, fought tooth and nail to block the 13th Amendment. The abolition of slavery created a huge humanitarian crisis in the South. Suddenly, four million people have very little means to take care of themselves, to support themselves, and do so in a really, really hostile environment. So the military was necessary to make sure that enslaved people got the food, the medicine, the shelter that they needed in order to survive. They're also there to protect, to the extent that that was possible, free people from violence, from recriminations, from slaveholders, from Confederates who still hadn't given up the fight. And I remember when the Yankees stopped here, and the Yankees stopped right here on the corner of square, and the first speaking people knew, we, we go to the ground scene, and they take them, hang them up with a storm. That's the punishment they got. Next time you see, they come a whole troop of Yankees, all riding horses. When the last federal troops leave the South, it's a signal to Southerners. The federal government wasn't going to put its might into ensuring the civil rights of Black people would be observed. You have 20, 30 years later, Black people being lynched in public and there isn't a, a federal anti-lynching law to protect them. In most communities in America, there's a history of lynching and racial violence. And very few communities have marked that, commemorated that. 
Every decade since the end of slavery, Black people have been more educated, accrued more wealth, more status in American society. Every decade since 1865. But there's been one constant, and that constant is the presence of random racist violence. What I see in George Floyd's murder was a white police officer attempting to dominate and to subdue a black man who was not resisting, who could not resist. Even though slavery came to an end in 1865, the desire to master and dominate black bodies did not. And we have never dealt with that. These are the kinds of stark realities that are highlighted during Juneteenth. If black people's lives can be expunged through racist violence and no one is held accountable, how free are we? Are we free? My name is Ruby Blake, and the scripture this morning is taken from March, um, I'm sorry, Mark 4, verses 35 through 41. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? the word of God before us, the word of God with us. Amen. been walking with my face turned to the sun weight on my shoulders a bullet in my gun oh I got eyes in the back of my head just in case I had I do what I can when I can while I can for my people while the 
clouds roll back and the stars fill the night that's when i'm gonna stand up take my people with me together we are going to a brand new home far across the river can you hear freedom calling calling me to answer gonna keep on keeping on i can feel it Once you pray with me.
her power, for your holy, righteous power, for life-giving power, we pray. Amen. Jesus passive-aggressively calms a storm on a boat with his disciples late at night, asleep and unconcerned. He is awoken by a panicked people looking at him to do something about the windstorm that has kicked up around them all. The boat is rocking and the waves are high and the disciples are freaking out, unsure of what their fate may be. Teacher, they admonish. Do you not care that we're perishing? And Jesus wakes up, shouts the phrase, peace, be still, almost by reflex. And then the wind ceases and there's a dead calm. And Jesus looks at his previously panicked but now placated disciples and asks, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? See, his response is remarkable because instead of being afraid himself of the present storm, Jesus spends his time resting up, saving his energy for the ministry awaiting him on the shoreline. His presence, his response is remarkable because instead of celebrating that the storm is over, Jesus stays bothered that the disciples are asking him to expend his power on that which he does not find to be the most pressing issue of this present moment. His response is remarkable because when moments of social distress result in rocked boats and rough waves, the people want quick solutions to save the boat instead of keeping their eyes fixed on where that boat is headed. Let me say that one more time. Jesus's response here is remarkable because when moments of social distress result in rocked boats and rough waves, the people want quick solutions to save the boat instead of keeping their eyes fixed on where that boat is headed. I hope you're following me this morning, Union. I know some of you maybe came hoping for a political sermon, but I'm just going to stick with preaching the Bible this morning. See, I'm aware that Jesus might seem rude or ungrateful here, that his response maybe wasn't appropriate at a time when the people around him just wanted to sail undisturbed in smooth waters again, that if you take this moment in time and you place it under a microscope, you'd be compelled to say that Jesus was maybe a little cranky, a little whiny, a little unreasonable, self-serving, and should have maybe first empathized with the people trying to stop the boat from being rocked before questioning whether or not they know the difference between acting out of fear or faith. But in order to understand this present moment, beloved, you have to pay attention to all of the things that have happened before it. It's this reading trick I picked up from scholars of critical race theory. It's not just about the text, but about the context. It's not just about what happened today, but what happened in history, not just about the issue before us, but the unresolved issues that came before us. You see, this way of interpreting the gospel might feel foreign to some and rather natural to others, but it is the way we must read our story so that we might be clear about the future toward which God is leading us. This story didn't start on a boat. It started on a shoreline before they hopped on the boat setting off to see before Jesus called them to go to the other side. This story started on the shoreline. It started far from rough waves and violent winds. They called him teacher, not just as an honorific, but as an apt descriptor of what his ministry actually was. Mark chapter four starts, and again, he began to teach beside the sea. See, the crowds were gathered because they knew Jesus always brought a provocative word and that they just had to hear what all of the fuss was about. But while Jesus might be one who teaches, 
that doesn't mean his work is all talk. You see, to really teach the people about the kingdom of God, the justice we are owed, the power of spirit, you have to realize it's about more than just theorizing heaven and hell. It's about healing. It's about saving. It's about liberating. We need education and we also need action because teaching people where the fire is, who started the fire, who continues to get disproportionately burned and what our options are for putting it out will raise awareness about the fire, yes, but unless those people start rolling up their sleeves and grabbing some water or better yet, putting down the gas canister, that fire will continue to destroy everything in its path. You see, I am convinced that if, that if Jesus didn't choose to leave the crowd and travel to the other side of the sea, that crowd would have tried to keep him there, distracting him from the God ordained work at hand. Crowds love to talk. They love to hear their own voices. They love to comment on the fire and make speculations about the fire and theorize about the fire's validity and the seriousness and power of the fire. And sometimes bring both burn victims and fire starters on television to debate fires and whether or not we should stop them instead of putting out the damn fire. Jesus knows there is a time to reason with the crowd and a time to set them aside and run towards those who are hurting here and now. So he tells his disciples to get in the boat because contrary to what they have led you to believe, we still have a world to save. So as the disciples get distracted by the rough waters on their journey, Jesus reminds them that he called them to get somewhere. So he passive aggressively calms the storm as if to say this choppy water is inconvenient and when the water is still the ride feels a bit smoother yes but don't you realize i am not taking you out to this sea but to what is on the other side of it as if to say i am the one who put us on this boat that is actually designed to take us from point a to point b and so i'm sorry if i'm not terribly impressed that your only concern is this present storm as if to say i will calm this storm Yes, but don't you know that the trouble isn't over? Teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? The disciples cry. And what a relatable cry it is. Where are you, God? Are you watching these storms that surround us? Don't you care? Don't you care? Don't you care? And it's almost as though Jesus responds, Yes, I do care. I do care a lot that you are perishing, which is why I'm not going to waste my energy paying too much attention to this particular distraction, which is why I am trying to get you to see the task at hand, which is why I am getting us to the other side of this choppy sea. Yes, I can make the water smoother for you. I can cause the storm to break and the stars to shine brightly over this boat. But best believe we are headed into a different storm that is not so easily identifiable. You see, we cannot stop paying attention to what will happen next just because the boat is not rocking as violently as it once was. We have to stay on task, have to keep reading. We have to get to the other side of the sea where Jesus is leading us. Mark chapter 5 will tell you exactly where the boat was headed where Christ was leading his disciples and it was into a very different kind of storm, a very important storm, a storm that didn't really look like a storm up close, but zoom out just a bit. And you'd realize this storm was swallowing up whole people in the quietest of ways. On the other side of the rough waters, they'll arrive to the country of the Gerasenes where a man is plagued with a legion of evil spirits, historical spirits that had gone unattended and ignored for so long that they now haunted the very lands from which they supposedly left. Maybe if the disciples 
were not so panicked about the boat being rocked, Jesus could have told them, listen, there are bodies, real bodies, the people of God, my people, being haunted and hunted by an evil to which they did not consent. And unless we work to confront them, exercise them, heal them here and now, they will continue to ravage this world in many different shapes and forms unchecked and unacknowledged. So I will calm this present storm. I will make the water a bit more smooth. I will get us to the shore, but I need you to stay just as alert once we arrive because the real storm has already been raging far longer than this present moment. It's almost as if Jesus is saying the storm is not rough waves and violent winds and rocked boats. The storm is the legion of demons taking people still alive into graves of despair. The storm is not embarrassingly long overdue federal holidays. The storm is a white supremacist police state that profits off of a prison industrial complex that disproportionately exploits, destroys, and maims Black lives. The storm is not having your seat of government-sanctioned power challenged. The storm is the people who have been crying, see us, hear us, know us, far longer before you started on your campaign trail. The storm is not getting American leadership to pay lip service to its past wrongs. The storm is acknowledging that the second this beast called America gets its hands around the throat of liberation, the only thing it knows to do is how to trade market, profit off of it, and subsume it back into the white supremacist, classist, capitalist machine that is our common life life together. Okay, so maybe I am feeling just a bit political, but reading the gospel will do that to you because you know as well as I do that next year Target will sell offensively trendy Juneteenth teas while an almost all white executive team reaps the profits. You see, they call Jesus teacher because part of his mission is to prepare the crowd for what is waiting on the other side of the sea. And there are those seeds sung, um, sown among the thorns, Jesus says to the crowds, that are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word and it yields nothing. Does it sound familiar? I think maybe Jesus can and does make the rough ways a bit smoother for us. But he also demands liberation from the evil power still holding us captive. You know, my best friend, uh, Jake, knew I'd be up writing this sermon all morning. And while he had no clue what I was preaching, he sent me an excerpt from an article he'd stumble across, knowing it was going to light this medical, this uh, metaphorical fire that would ignite the passion I needed for the final push to finish. Instead of celebrating Juneteenth, this new federal holiday, the article reads, many on the left have chosen to turn immediately to their next quest. But perhaps it shouldn't be so surprising this tendency is built into the very name of what they call themselves progressives. There is no satisfaction with any victories or improvements made. It's always on to the next thing, end quote. See, for a far right-winged journalistic machine that holds Jesus so tightly to their pen, he's basically in chains. I'm wondering if they've ever actually read the gospel. You see, we who follow Jesus know that this boat we're in is headed somewhere. 
and that when one storm is calmed, we've got to set our sights back on the trouble ahead. This is the Christ in whom we profess our belief, one who isn't interested in placating those who cannot handle the boat being rocked too much, one who isn't interested in processing through the storm that has just passed, but one who says, why aren't you getting ready for what is waiting for us on the shoreline? Waters will be rough, beloved. The wind will blow, the sea will roll, but you are in the boat with a captain who holds the future, who will not let the storms of respectability sway you, who instead says, I calmed this storm so that you could rest your weary bones, catch your breath, quiet your soul, for there is another kind of storm that we too will still. Just you wait. So may the scriptures continue to remind us that the political is the biblical and the biblical is the political. That Jesus cares not simply about what you have to learn, but what you do once you learn it. And most importantly, that even when the boat is rocked and you find yourself shaken, there is one who is resting in the stern, unafraid, who will remind you exactly what your God can do. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Wow. Always such a gift to hear from Simona and do it with her dad, Plumman. And indeed, beloved, better days are coming. It's the celebration and the promise of Juneteenth. It's a celebration, a promise, and even a challenge that better days are indeed coming. You know, as Pastor Nikki said, Jesus is the captain of our ship, but a captain doesn't do it alone. It takes everybody on the ship to co-participate to make it happen. And we are on that ship together here at Union with Jesus as our at our helm. And beloved, we're a place where we raise consciousness, we talk about the important things, and then we move to action. We're a place that makes love happen. We make liberation happen in this world with Jesus as our captain. So beloved, if you don't know, God is doing something wonderful here at Union. Big things are happening. We're getting very excited. And you may need a personal invitation, so here it is. We need you here at Union. If you're looking for a faith community, if you're looking for a place to call your spiritual home, Union is that place. We need you, we need your passion, your ideas, and just your presence. Because without you, we aren't as whole as we could be. So beloved, if you wanna be a part of Union and join in formal membership, I would encourage you to go to unionboston.org slash join, where you can send a message uh, to the pastoral team and one of us, Pastor Jay or Pastor Nikki or myself, would love to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you about what it means to join in membership here at Union. So beloved, the doors of the church are open. Why don't you come? Why don't you come? And now I want to invite Minister Michaela to lead our offering this day. Good morning, beloved. Yes, Union, I'm Minister Michaela and it is time for the offering. There are many ways to share our gifts with our church community. And thank you for clapping, yes. Um, there are many ways to share our gifts with our church community and one of them is through tithing and offering gifts of monetary balances. So there are three ways to give. The first way is through giving online. You can go to unionboston.org slash give, or you can use the um, church, Union Church Boston app. The second way to give is texting any dollar amount to 84321. And then the third way is you can send us a check. Uh, the address is on the slide. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Hallelujah. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, beloved. Uh, I started worship in the hotel room, and now you see uh, I'm out in the park and change wardrobe. And that's one of the things that I am going to miss about, uh, you know, worshiping on Zoom is the capacity, right, for those of you who have multitasked during service um, and being able to call in from the comfort of your home, uh, even though uh, we have adapted and made uh, this Zoom sanctuary work. Uh, we are looking forward to a change, uh, to be able to enter the building and worship, uh, lead worship from the building for the first time in 2021. Uh, what I'm saying is that you should have received in your inbox on Friday a briefing, a briefing for our plans and our schedule for uh, resuming in-person, in-building sanctuary. If you haven't checked it out, it'll be uh, part of the e-blast uh, for our worship service, but you can also just go to unionboston.org forward slash re-entry. The long and the short of it is that uh, we made a commitment last May uh, 2020 that we would not re-enter until everyone could re-enter safely. Now that vaccines are widely available for um, everybody 12 and older and the curve has been flattened, uh, we are uh, following the science and we're moving uh, forward into what um, uh, worship might look like back in the building. Of course, our building will be different. The accessibility renovation is well underway, almost to completion. We'll have an update video on that soon, uh, but part of that process, and here's the, the main point, move forward. We are not re-entering immediately because we have to still be able to have the uh, digital capacity to live stream uh, and include those of us uh, who are not in the Boston area in our worship. We have grown extraordinarily over the pandemic and have received new members who just don't live in Boston. And then for those who aren't yet feeling safe, who do live in Boston, to be part uh, of in-person worship in the building. We want to be able to continue to have Zoom. Uh, so met with Verizon Comcast engineers on Wednesday. Hopefully we'll have an update on when we'll have high-speed internet in the church because we are using DSL, uh, which uh, will not uh, facilitate a, a live service. So stay tuned. Uh, we know there's anxiety and that people want to uh, resume to singing together and we're pushing to make that happen. So go to unionboston.org forward slash re-entry, get more details. If you have any suggestions, uh, please uh, be in touch. I'm convening a re-entry team uh, in the coming weeks so that we can think about the dynamics. But just know that your leaders are uh, serving you and will make sure, as I'm seeing in the chat, that we move into the 21st century at Union as soon as it is uh, humanly possible. Uh, before um, I turn it over to our GBIO core team, can we give a hand clap of praise for our preacher? Uh, what a word that was. I'm so grateful for Pastor Nikki and the ways in which she continues to break open, to speak, the, break open the word, to speak those, uh, right, those simple messages. Uh, she said she, was, she wasn't going to be biblical. I mean, she wasn't going to be political. She was just going to be uh, biblical. And we see that those things are indeed one and the same. So we are grateful, grateful, grateful uh, for this community. Um, and uh, we had, uh, as we have our summer at Union, uh, you should note that we had our first happy hour on this past Friday. And I believe we had a, a paint night with Aaron uh, scheduled uh, soon. Uh, so stay tuned uh, so much as to our GBIO team for their update to our community. As this biblical, uh, political way of, of leading and bringing liberation into existence. Amen. Yeah, thanks, Pastor Jay. Um, this is Reverend Kyle. Uh, I'm going to bring on Scott. And is Anne also with us, Scott? So just Scott Lewis this morning. Um, very excited. Um, yeah, we have a wonderful core team for our GBIO team. You know, we've got about 30 people connected to GBIO Union, and we've got a core team of about six of us. And uh, we had a great conversation um, as we're, we're figuring out. Um, we had our listening campaign, and we've, uh, we've gotten lots of great data. And Scott actually has a report for the congregation as we do this work 
on behalf of Union, we'll be coming back periodically to make sure y'all are in the know and know how we're moving uh, to, to promote the gospel liberation through advocacy work in Boston. So Scott, the floor is yours. Thank you, Reverend Kyle. Good morning, Union. Uh, there is a core team that's been working on this uh, GBO, uh, GBIO uh, project. Uh, Reverend Kyle's been leading it. Alicia, and Aaron, Vivian, Sia, and I make up the core team. And I just wanted to give you a quick report on what we've been doing. Uh, we held four listening sessions to hear your stories and learn what was most troubling to the members of this congregation. And 38 of you participated. Uh, we're really grateful for that. Uh, it was a lot of people and each of you who participated told us very personal stories about the ways in which racial inequity and other social problems had affected you individually. Uh, there was a lot of focus on housing displacement, affordability, conditions, a lot of talk about addiction and inequities in healthcare and other issues. We funneled all of the stories that we heard to GBIO. And just to put this in context very quickly, there are 50 congregations that are participating. There were a total of 250 listening sessions. 1,425 people told their stories. A couple of weeks ago, we got together and all the core teams got together and, and learned how GBIO had synthesized what had been told. And I just want to give you a quick overview. They focused on three themes, racial justice, income inequality they referred to boston as a city a tale of two cities uh, environmental justice was other another big issue and they talked about seven particular problem areas and for each problem area somebody from the larger gbio community told a story they let off with housing and a shout out here goes to our own melissa pearson who uh, is an extraordinary uh, person and really a, a wonderful order and she gave a personal story about housing. Uh, other issues are health care, homelessness and addiction, policing, re-entry, immigration, education. Um, over the last couple of weeks there have been a bunch of regional caucuses where people have gotten together to try to figure out where's the greatest need for action and where can we make a difference. Um, and a steering committee has been created to I try to help sort through all of that and another member of our congregation, Alicia Brereton, who's part of the core group, is going to be on that steering committee. So this is great. Uh, and we, uh, we're going to invite all of the people who participated in the listening sessions to come back to talk about what members of this congregation can actually do. I mean, hearkening back to uh, what Pastor Nikki told us earlier, at the end of the day, it's about action. And so we're going to get together and actually talk about what we can do to take action to deal with some of these problems. Uh, and that will consummate in, on August 12th. There's going to be a regrouping of all of GBIO. And I just, uh, you know, I want to say it's an, a, an immense privilege to be part of this core team. Uh, one of the things that was reconfirmed for those of us who are on it and are kind of new to this community is the... Uh, amazing recognition of union's leadership over the years in social action. And I'm confident that through this process, uh, we're gonna continue to be leaders taking action to redress uh, social injustice. So thank you all. Yeah, thank you so much, Scott. And for those of you that wanna get more involved with GBIO, please reach out to me or just email office at unionboston.org. We would love for you to uh, have more conversations with us about what this work will entail. And come July, most likely we'll have another like big caucus meeting as a union to talk about, you know, what are the, what is the most important issue or two and how we can have concrete actions, actions as just a congregation in addition to our work with GBIO. So be looking forward to that. So thank you so much, Scott. Hey man, give it up for Scott. Come on, put your hands together for uh, Scott Lewis. So grateful for leadership, uh, for new parts of our community stepping right in and, uh, and leading the way. Um, so uh, Reverend Kyle, how does it feel? Um, this is like your first uh, Sunday in worship leadership as a reverend. <laughs> I'm just tickled by that. <laughs> it feels great. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful affirmation, and uh, it, I, I do feel empowered by this whole process and by being with you all, so thank you.
Amen. So thanks for leading us as we come to the close of this service, uh, beloved. Uh, do note that our, uh, our our weekly meditation has been changed from Fridays uh, to Wednesdays. We've got a paint night coming up. Uh, there's a lot happening. Um, we, we're, we, we need you, as Reverend Kyle offered in the invitation, uh, to help continue to push and enact this vision of liberation and of justice, uh, of an emancipation for all people until equity is won. So join us. We're looking forward to this wonderful summer. And so it's appropriate then as we close this service uh, to sing the uh, Black National Anthem. So we invite you to stand in body or in spirit, lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Let's make this our closing praise. Amen. this benediction, beloved, don't forget to look for the shoreline. Look to the shoreline. And now may the grace of God, may the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always until we meet God face to face. Amen.
minds are unmuted, feel free to unmute yourself, greet your neighbor, and go in peace. Happy Be Father's Day, everybody. Have a good week, everyone.